Well, see, the ancients were sensitive to this, apparently. There was a meteorite that created the, the whole, that ends up creating the Kaaba in Mecca that they still worship, a meteorite stone that's in there. 2,000 years before Muhammad. That wasn't invented, that's something Islam adopted. It was there uh, thousands of years before. The word Cairo, the city of Cairo, was named, that's Arabic for the planet Mars. Why? What's that got to do with pyramids and all of that? And of course, that's the site of the Great Pyramid and so on. Athens, we all speak of the, you know, the uh, Arapacus in, in, in Acts 17. Ares is the name in Greek for Mars. It's pictured as a source of judgment, really. Yeah, Mars Hill, that's why they call it Mars Hill, in the Arapacus in Greek. And uh, Dionysus was a member of that sect. Well, in the Bible, of course, we encounter a strange event called the Battle of Beth Horon in Joshua chapter 10. The kings there confederate against Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem. He's sort of a foreshadowing of what we call today the Antichrist. He's defeated with stones of fire from heaven. And the sun was commanded to stand still, be silent, to give Joshua more time to complete the route. And, and the sun and the moon were extended apparently for the equivalence of a whole day. And kings hide in caves and are dealt with and that completes the whole southern strategy of Joshua's thing. And the rest of the book of Joshua is just a cleanup after that. Well, what is this business of Joshua asking the sun to stand still? Most of us think, well, gee, that would mean the earth would have to stop spinning. No, it turns out all you'd have to do is change the procession a little bit. It would accomplish the same thing. But it's interesting, we discover that all ancient calendars were based on 360-day years. And uh, uh, typically 12, 30-day months making a year. But then they change. In 701 B.C., all these ancient calendars have adjustments made to them. We discover that Mars was worshipped by the ancient cultures. And out of all of this background, there is a hypothesis that is hard to disprove, that, that Mars made near passbys to the Earth. I'll come to that in a minute. But the idea is that Earth and Mars originally were on resonant orbits. Resonance... The orbits act just like tuning forks. If you have a tuning fork that you hit and there's one of the same frequency across the room, it'll, it'll resonate to it. Orbits are the same way. Orbits will have a tendency to get in step with either the primary or the harmonic of, of its rotation. Well, the Earth and Mars apparently are believed to be originally on resonant orbits. I'll show you a diagram here in a minute. And they had near passbys every 108 years. And it turns out by modeling this, it would account for catastrophic events on a number, in fact, seven of them, throughout recorded history. And these energy transfers all apparently tra stabilized in 71 BC, which caused the calendars to be redone. And so let's take a look at this. You have the Earth. We know that the Earth is at the foci of an ellipse, and like all of them are. And it's not necessarily a circular. It's an, or it's a, it's an oval, but we're at, this, we're at the, the foci of the oval. And Mars is the same thing except they overlap. And uh, originally, they were on resonant orbits. The Earth on a 360-day orbit, Mars on a 720-day orbit. But there were times when they came near each other every 108 years. In the spring, if, it, if they came near each other in the spring, it would be March 20, 21st. It would be inside after perihelion. And, and uh, it, uh, the, uh, Mars would lose a little energy. Earth would gain a little energy. They pass again in, in a, every 108 years, but the next one would be in the fall, October 25th, and it would be, this time it would ha pass behind the Earth, and it, it, there would be a, uh, the Earth would lose a little energy, Mars would gain a little energy. This kept going on until each time, until it finally stabilized, and, and, with it, and uh, that's when the 360 day orbit becomes 365 and a quarter. That's why we have a leap year and some months different. And that's at Mars, it went from 720 down to 687. Earth gained a little, Mars lost a little. Now, that's a theory, but it turns out there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, support for that. But one of the most provocative confirmations comes from all places from the travels of Lemuel Gulliver, which is a children's story written by, as we would look at it, by Jonathan Swift. It actually was some political satire of the day we regard it as some children's stories. But before we get into that, I want to review telescope technology. Most of you know that Galileo was famous for the, the first serious use of the telescope in 1610, and with that he discovered the four moons of Jupiter and Saturn's rings. Big deal. 
1781, Herschel, with a better telescope, discovers the planet Uranus. A little later, a couple of years later, in fact, six years later, he discovers the two moons of Uranus. And then a couple of years later, he discovers two more moons. See, the, the telescope technology is improving, better telescopes. Till you get to 1846, Lavier discovered Neptune and one of its moons. Then you get to 1877, a guy by the name of Asaph Hall, with a brand new telescope in the United States Naval Observatory, discovers, he makes astronomical history because he discovers that Mars has two moons. They didn't know that. And he names them Dimas and Phobos. And uh, Dimas is about, has a, uh, an orbit about 30 hours and 18 minutes. See, our moon has a 20, a 30 day orbit, right? This one has a 20, 30 hour, it's uh, 18 minutes. And it's almost synchronous. In other words, it would appear almost to be stationary. And uh, then uh, Phobos is 7 hours and 39 minutes. And Phobos is unique in the entire solar system. It's the only one that goes backwards. Everything else goes westward. This one particular satellite, for some reason, is going eastward. And the reason it's so hard to see, it's, almost, it's very small. It's only 8 miles across. And it is almost black. It has a reflectivity of only 3%. In other words, it's almost black. That's why it's so hard to see. That's why it made such history when Asaph Hall spotted it. Little background. Well, that's 1877. Jonathan Swift published his story called Gulliver's Travels. It actually was a collection of essays for political satire, but in 1726. Now, we all know his, the, 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 the Gulliver who visited the place called Laputa with all the little people, right? That's our story. The third voyage of Gulliver, different story, but in the same collection, is he goes to a place called Laputa. And in Laputa, the, the astronomers there are very, they, they make fun of London because they know about the two moons of Mars and the people in London don't know about it. It's just a story, just a colorful children's story, except in the story, it details the size and the revolutions of these two moons of Mars within about 20% of what we know of them a day, and it mentions that one of them is going backwards. Now the problem is, how did Jonathan Swift put that in the story? Because he published that 151 years before the astronomical world discovered the two moons of Mars. Well, we, we don't know. We presume that what Gulliver, uh, uh, Jonathan Swift did was that he drew upon some legends to embroider his little story. He probably didn't realize that what the, the legends that he was drawing upon were actually eyewitness accounts. They'd have to be eyewitness accounts because this 151 years before you had the telescope technology to see these things, unless Mars be, got so close to, on one of these passbys that you could see them with the naked eye. That's why this is such a provocative piece of news. Now let's talk about the long day of Joshua. A third of a million men were at Beth Horon. And October 25th, 1404 B.C., Mars was on a polar pass at 70,000 miles. That's very close. It appeared to rise 50 times the size of the moon. Severe earthquakes and land tides. Polar shift of about 5 degrees would lengthen the day, incidentally. Meteors followed about 2 or 3 hours later at about 30,000 miles an hour. And this whole drama is included in other ancient legends and folklore also. There's a long, we're, in, we're indebted to Emanuel Velikovsky, who discovered there's a legend of a long night in China in this period. So all this seems to be corroborative of what the Bible is, sounds so strange to us, but we discover when you get behind the scenes, it's not so strange. Mm -hmm.